So last night, I talked a little bit about the idea of a roche, a head, particularly the head of a fish that appears on many a Rosh Hashanah table and has for many centuries. But the idea of what it means to hold our heads up, to act with seicho, with wisdom, with clear eyes. So with the idea of Rosh on one hand, if you will, this morning, with your permission, I'd like to share a little bit about the idea of Hashanah. We translate the word Hashanah into English as year, but year is one of those words in English, and there are many, that doesn't quite capture the majesty and the mystery of its partner Hebrew word. The word Shana stems from the root meaning both to repeat and to change. In a wonderful piece on the etymology, the origin of the word Shana by historian Mitchell First, he refers to this idea of the Shana as the repeating cycle of seasonal change. And he quotes the biblical concordance by Solomon Mandelkern, which points out what we all know, that even though we repeat something, every time something is revisited or done again, there is a slight change. There is no exact copy of the cycle that came before. Coming around again, returning to the beginning, always implies a journey in the interim. With it all, there is the sense, though, that by coming around again, we start anew. Maybe not with an entirely clean slate, but coming around again nonetheless. What a gift. There are so many round things this time of year, so many repeating circles. We've got pomegranates and apples and round challahs and crown imagery everywhere. The birthday of the world that Rosh Hashanah is often called, this concept that should compel us to celebrate and pledge to care for this big blue marble that is our home and to remind ourselves to stand in awe of the spherical glowing orbs that fill our cosmos with light and should fill our hearts with wonder. But here we are in this unimaginable, and to say it again for the millionth time, indescribable and unprecedented moment in history. Here we are rounding the curve of the first half circle around the sun marking now slightly more than six months in this new and astonishing reality. It's one thing to have a beautiful meal from start to finish with round foods. And I have some close family members who've done exactly that, from round appetizers to meatballs to round apple dumplings at the end. But circles are so much on my mind this particular year. In Jewish legend, there is a man whose name is Choni. Choni lived during the Second Temple period, if in fact he was a real person at all. But for the sake of our story, we will say that he lived somewhere between 200 and 50 before the Common Era. He was known as a rainmaker, someone who could be called in when times were tough. And once during his lifetime, the people turned to Choni and asked him to pray for rain. A terrible drought was, see was descending upon the ancient Holy Land and they needed his help. He prayed, but no rain fell. So what did Choni do? He did something for which he was known. He stood 
and drew a circle around himself. He stood in the center and called out, Master of the universe, your children have turned to me because I am like a member of your own household. I swear by your great name that I will not move from this circle until you have mercy upon your children. Now, Choni gets around a little bit. He appears in a number of places in the Babylonian Talmud. This story comes particularly from the Mishnah Ta'anit, chapter 2, pages 10 through 12. Choni draws a circle around himself and stands there, essentially throwing a tantrum, stamping his feet and beating his fists until he gets what we all so desperately needed. He doesn't get it right away, and we'll come back to that in just a few minutes. Choni was known as Choni Hameagel, Choni, the circle maker. Many weeks ago, or it might have been years, the way time has been working in the last half circle around the sun, I saw a picture from my beloved San Francisco of Alamo Square Park, the irony of which just dawned on me last night. Alamo Square Park, across from the beautiful painted ladies, which are so much of the personality and tourism imagery of our beautiful city. This picture of Alamo Square Park showed everyone who had come out on a beautiful day, confined to a delineated white circle. Each of us in this last half shana, this last half year, has had to be a choni. We have had no choice but to draw circles around ourselves and in one degree or another, pray, sing, stamp our feet, cry out with no choice but to say, I will stay in this circle until there is mercy upon all of us. We have likely spun in literal and metaphoric circles in our homes and in our minds, creating a circumference of safety in public spaces and an imagined sense of safety everywhere we go. For so many, every day has felt the same, a loop of repetition, mercifully delineated for many, as I've heard in a number of places, by only the rumble of the garbage trucks and the coming in of the Sabbath, which is really poetic, that for some people, our weeks have been defined by the sending away of what we no longer need or want and the welcoming in of what perhaps we've always known we needed or have discovered we are so hungry for and so ready to receive. The enforced circles that we have had to create around ourselves, however, maybe can help us change and grow. For many, so many though, these little bubbles we've had to impose around ourselves have been so restrictive, so isolating. They are a space of keep out. There are a number of Boy Scouts in my family and they all know what it is to create what is known in the scouting world as a blood circle, but maybe much more nicely known as it is often now called a safety circle. It's a term used by the scouts to describe the area within the radius of the arm and blade length combined when using and learning to use a knife safely or a saw or an ax. The area is envisioned as a sphere with a person and a sharp instrument at its center. And presumably anyone within this radius is at risk of injury. To protect injury to others, it has always been considered desirable 
to keep other people out of that circle at all times when holding a potentially deadly weapon. Despite that idea of a circle around ourselves, keeping what could hurt us at bay and keeping what we are holding potentially that could hurt others from crossing that invisible but powerful barrier, there is also the idea, and thank God we've heard so many stories about this, about how circles during this time have expanded far beyond anything we could have possibly imagined. Our circles of learning, of friendship, of worship communities, of contact with old friends and connections with new, in some cases, when we have been able to expand those circles during this bizarre and upside down time, people have found new hope, a new sense of spiritual, virtual embrace from worlds they knew little of but six months ago. Take a moment, please, and think about your circle of these last many months. How has your circle expanded, if it has? If it hasn't, how would you like it to? What space is there to welcome in new experiences, new horizons, new skills, new relationships? Who's been in that circle with you? Who has surrounded you, whether in person, if you are so blessed, or virtually, if you are so blessed, to help you in this time? As we come to Rosh Hashanah, who or what would you add to that circle as we round the curve? In one of these rabbinic circles over the last few months, we were reminded of a teaching by a remarkable, innovative rabbi here in Los Angeles. She's quite well known, and some of you may know of her teachings. Rabbi Sharon Brous of the Ikar community was in dialogue with Pastor Eddie Anderson of McCarthy Memorial, a remarkable interfaith, cross-cultural, dialogue of friendship, harmony, and hope. It was a remarkable session. Rabbi Brous began by teaching the foundational premise of Judaism that we revisit all the time, Genesis 1, verse 27, that each person is created b'tselem elokim, in the image of God. And then she reminded us of a collection of interpretations called Devarim Rabbah, a collection of rabbinic teachings based on the book of Deuteronomy. In it, we learned, Rabbi Joshua ben Levi said, a procession of angels walk before a person wherever he goes, blowing the shofar and announcing, make way for the image of the Holy One. A procession of angels blowing the shofar announcing make way for the image of the Holy One. What would the world look like if we could take that idea to heart? If each human life was considered worthy of a circle of angels blowing the shofar, announcing that each is created in the image of God. One of the participants in this wonderful group, Rabbi Michelle Lenke, suggested that the image perhaps could be a way of understanding this six feet of distance that we have had to impose between ourselves and others. Maybe the six feet doesn't have to be a void. Maybe it doesn't have to be empty. 
Maybe we can envision it as making room for the individual and invisible angels that surround each of us. Maybe we can turn this on its head and decide that we're not keeping a physical distance, not trying to get away from each other, but perhaps we're making space for our angels. Who have been your angels accompanying you on this journey? In the Sefer Yitzirah, the oldest mystical text that gave rise to the schools of Kabbalah, of Jewish mysticism, the Sefer Yitzirah is a tiny and marvelously incomprehensible little book suggesting that the universe was created by 10 divine forces and the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. It's a remarkable journey to take. The Sefer Yitzirah, whose author is unknown, describes the circle of existence as the end and wedged in the beginning. It's a word I've never seen written out. The end and wedged in the beginning. A seamless circle that surrounds us all and that can be infinitely expanded without beginning, without end, because there is no me or you. There is only us in this circle of existence whose end is enwedged in the beginning. When we sing Adon Olam, as some of us have done hundreds, if not thousands of times, that most sublime prayer poem, Right in the center we sing Beli Reshit, Beli Tachlit, without beginning and without end. As we traverse the circle of the year and the circles of our lives, may we do so with a glorious sense of without beginning and without end a continuum of love and friendship that, if we allow it, can expand ever outward to encompass all of creation in a circle of hope and peace. May this time of shana, of repetition and of change, be for good, for life, and for blessing. Shana Tova.